Uh, we will have the last speaker of today. Uh, Phil Smith is coming from uh, US. He's a nutritionist at uh, Tyson Food, and he will give us uh, his perspective in this regard. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's a really an honor and pleasure to be here in Germany and with Bauman and appreciate all their hospitality. They've just a beautiful venue here. And uh, also, I'd like to thank you guys for sticking this out to stay to the end. I know you've been here uh, since 8 o'clock and hearing talks and four straight in a row. Hey, man, that's, that's a marathon. I'm, I appreciate your uh, patience. Well, first off, I have a couple of ground rules. First, if you need to go to the restroom because you've been sitting here so long or need to answer the phone or do something, do that. And please think of questions. If you don't get to ask the questions, come and see me afterwards because I like that engagement because I like to get to know you guys better. And, and uh, the main thing I've got to share with you is not anything complicated. It's very simple, just straightforward stuff that these guys have already told you everything about sustainability that I, I you know, when I put this talk together, I said, oh, God, sustainability. Uh, we do that all the time. That's why we're staying, trying to stay in business, you know. So a lot of the things that you're going to hear are have already, you've already heard over and over and over again. I can't make it any clearer. But, um, so what I want you to do is just have fun, relax, because this is real easy. I'm not trying to know real scientific, deep, too much deep stuff for sure. So bear with me as I go through with this. You know, when I looked up sustainability, you know, something that endures or something to give support to. We've talked about that, you know. And the poultry industry is really, it, it's a fantastic model for sustainability the way I look at it. You know, and I'm in all kinds of meats. I, I'm, I'm a beef producer myself, and I love beef, and I think it's sustainable. So, you know, it has to be, or we wouldn't be in this business like we have for all these years. And uh, I'll just go on. You know, what does sustainability mean to a broiler company? Again, you know, the poultry operation must be profitable. To me, if we're not profitable, we're not going to stay in business and help all the other the legs. I know we've got to have the environment, we've got the social responsibility with people, but that's the bottom thing there. And so we have to take care of our producers. Now, we have a lot of contract growers. We don't have as many company farms, very few company farms. And I'll show a lot of pictures of farms here in a little bit. And it's those people that own those farms that make this thing go. If they can't make a living doing growing chickens uh, for us, either Pulitzer breeders or broilers, they're not going to stay in business and we're going to be in trouble. We'd have to build our own farms, which costs lots and lots of money. So they're a big part of our deal. We always have to be efficient, the efficiency of everything. If it's moving birds or hauling feed or making feed or processing birds, you know, we really want to be good at that. And that helps us lower the cost and keep our, keep our profits, at least most of the time. Sometimes we can get into a situation where we don't make profits. But if we can keep from losing more than the next guy, maybe we can stay in business, you see. We have to manage, you know, our flocks and performance. And we've got to have good carcass quality, so we've got to look at the end result. What we're trying to produce is a meat that the people want, the customer wants. Whatever form that is, uh, you know, if it needs to be organic, if that's what the people want, we'll do that. If, that's, if it's something we can make and do profit, profitably, or all vegetarian fed or antibiotic free or the La Belle Rouge, uh, free range, or any, any combination of all those things. And we were all t always trying to do that, look for these niche markets or, the, or further processed products. So meeting our consumers' expectations are huge. I mean, that's, that's the whole thing. If we don't have customers that are satisfied with what we're doing, we're not going to stay in business because we can't market our products. So what, you know, I'm a nutritionist, so what are you going to hear? You know, I love nutrition. I'm glad to get to talk to you guys because I get to share a little bit of nutrition. Uh, we just talked a little about alternate ingredients, like using something instead of soybean meal, like sunflower meal or canola meal. And hey, man, I'm all about that. Using alternative ingredients or, you know, we may be feeding insects one of these days or all kinds of byproducts, waste products. You know, if it, if it can be done and, and acceptable, we will we'll characterize those ingredients and use them. So that helps us to be, you know, more efficient, you know, more uh, effective. And that's, that's what my job is as a nutritionist. And we like to think we're good at it. You know, we do feed a lot of corn and soy, so we're blessed with corn and soy. But we feed a lot of DDGs. We feed some animal proteins. We feed uh, hominy, any kind of byproducts we can get. Wheat. We feed some wheat occasionally. We don't have as much wheat probably as some of the northern countries, but we do. Um, and I could go on and on. 
Well, why has the poultry industry th thrived? If you had a chance to read my write-up, I, I give the Tyson family the leadership of, the, of someone like Tyson. The founders, John Tyson, he started out really, you know, really humbly, just hauling birds, live birds, to markets in St. Louis, Cincinnati, Chicago. Well, he learned if he could take those birds a little further by feeding them on the way, he could stay in business and maybe make a little more profit. And from that, he started his own hatchery, and he started having people grow birds for him. So the leadership, the innovation, um, entrepreneurs, you know, that's what drives the leadership. If that, the whole, I could go on, P Purdue, the Field Elf, uh, or Georges, or Simmons, all these people that, you know, started it. It was started by people. Uh, and that leadership, and they, and they have to have all this other stuff to go with it, but, um, you know, that's, that's what's driven the industry and made us what we are today. Uh, I give those people the credit. They're the founders, and they started thinking how, you know. And there'll be more innovation as we go forward. I can assure you, this thing isn't slowing down, right, Mike? We're going we're gonna to keep talking. We're going to keep doing that. The other thing is vertical, in vertical integration. In our case, we're vertically integrated. We own, we own all these pieces, pretty much. We don't own the farms, but we set up the policies on how to grow the birds. All this biosecurity. Uh, we supply the feed. Uh, sometimes we'll source the feed from somewhere else, but most of the time we're going to spec exactly what we want in every piece of this thing. And you notice I didn't put nutrition at the top of the page. I put genetics. I know who, uh, what's moved us forward is more than anything is the selection. Cobb, Avigen, Hubbard, the genetics have given us the ability to improve efficiency, which has given us the ability to produce more meat with less resources. Housing and management right there next to it. Without that, like we talked about, those tunnel cool cell houses uh, in uh, Thailand, if you've been there, it's pretty sticky hot. You need to move a lot of air. You need airspeed. If you don't have airspeed, birds won't eat. They, don't, they feel that heat. So we've overcome a lot of that with great housing. So I'd say that's the second thing, management and housing to go with it. Now, controllers and people run the house, so it's still, you've got to go back to the people. Disease is important. Besides nutrition, disease, certainly, we've got to control disease. We've talked, heard a lot of veterinarians talking about gut health. Uh, Dr. Weidman, lameness, moment, well, God, those are big things we have to come over, ascites and things like that. And we're con constantly working on improving those things. Um, <coughs> catching the hauling, making feed, all those sorts of things are part of it. But we've got to process a quality food, whatever, whatever we're doing. If we're fully cooking it, or are we just selling raw meat in a box, you know? How are we handling it? And there's nothing wrong with any of those things. But we've got to be good at it. And that's helped the poultry industry, and that's why we've endured to this point. And I don't see, you know, as uh, Michael, Michael said, we've, that's the thing. The chicken should win, right? I mean, we should, we're in the room with people who know that, I think, uh, with as far as preferred meat, as of, we're so darn efficient at it. So we've got a lot of advantages. And I don't see that going away between here and the next 20 years or 30 years. But we still got to execute that right. We still got to go through and figure out how. We're going to take market share away, but we still need eggs, we need milk, we need beef, we need pork, we need fish, uh, lamb, et cetera. I'm not against any, believe me, any of those things, but we have so many advantages. We've just come through some of the highest feed cost, high protein, high corn prices, high feed cost prices. And guess, Tyson and the poultry industries probably around the world are making more profits than we ever have. Now there's a perfect storm, pet virus knocked the hog numbers down, at least in our country. Beef numbers, because of the droughts and stuff, there's fewer cattle, so there's less meat. Chicken's like a dollar a pound, uh, and beef's four, ground beef's four dollars a pound. Pork's two dollars, I mean, so we have a huge advantage to supply that. Very economical protein. And, and that's not just in the United States, it's pretty well around the world. Praise the Lord we can do that, that's a great blessing. Now, I've got a series of pictures, and I'm going to show houses here. Just from all over the world. This is a house in Springdale, Arkansas, and these, this couple right here are just a family farm. This is a man and a wife. They have four houses. They grow chickens for us. Uh, they kind of split up and two do, you know, they kind of compete against each other. They have their two houses. But I'm standing in this house. You can see this is a while back. Nowadays, because of avian influenza and LT and diseases, we'd be all suited, I'd be all suited up. Here, I'm just in plastic boots. But... It's so important to, you know, just have people like this that are interested, takes care of the birds. I mean, these are the guys out on the field that's taking care of business. And, of course, they're competitive. They have to compete. If their birds don't perform, they make less money. So they're, they're, in, a, they're in a competition with their growers that settle that week. 
So this couple right here, they built this barn. That's their, that's their, uh, that's their income. So whatever I do in the feed, I always think, oh, these people's livelihoods depending on it. I mean, they need to, you know, compete and have a good chance to be, have success. Because if they don't have success, we, we ain't, we ain't going to be in business. Last year, propane prices went out of sight. There was a shortage in the United States. Whew. We try to help those people because a big part of their cost is those utilities. They're paying for that gas to keep those birds warm. And this is the young birds here. This is the young birds. So always think about that. These people are partnered with us. They're not actually working for me. They're not getting a check, but they do get a check from Tyson for when they sell a flock of birds. Now, how many people can tell me where this is? It's not in the United States. Anybody want to guess the country that it is? And it's in Europe. Where? Not in Thailand. It's in Italy. It's in Italy. And I would tell you the company, but I was fortunate to get to visit. And you'll see, I'm going to show you some more places. You probably notice, uh, what does the Europeans want? They want natural sunlight, right? Uh, lots of feeders, lots of waters. This wasn't that long ago, guys. <laughs> now, we're growing now. Let's go to another place. This is a completely different place. Anybody guess where this is? <laughs> Go ahead, Natalie, tell them where this is. New Zealand. New Zealand. Boy, the world's capital for the most best performance in the world. Very little disease, don't vaccinate a lot. This is outside one of their chicken houses in the South Island of New Zealand, near Christchurch. Fantastic, beautiful place. Uh, if you get a chance, I certainly recommend going there. It is a long journey, but... <laughs> And I've got a few pictures inside. I'm not trying to sell cable bay feeders, but this is what was in this house. Now, they asked us before the earthquake. They had an earthquake there at, right after this. And near this, and I don't know, they lost a lot of barns. In their case, they call sheds. But they have phenomenal growth. Those birds, man, I can, if I told you, it's unbelievable. Uh, the weight gain feed conversion is, in Europe, is very good. But Australia and New Zealand is very, 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 very competitive. Uh, they feed a good ration, but a lot of it is, again, the management, the housing, the, the climate. Uh, I think these are all Ross birds, probably. Now, this is a different country. Who will tell me where this one is? You were close when you said Thailand. A little bit north there in an island. What would that be? Taiwan. Taiwan. And we talked about uh, f kind of a free-range loose birds. <laughs> These, these aren't colored birds, but they do have colored birds like black skin, yellow, silver. These are more common white, but they're grown loose for like 90 days because, again, they want to grow an older bird for more of a gamier, tastier, different flavor. Is there anything wrong with that? Do I have any problems with that? If the customer wants it, and that's what we, you know, we're all about supplying what the customer wants. So this is in Taiwan. Taiwan. Guess what? That's the same country, different farm. This is a double-deck steel house. Uh, it gets pretty hot in Taiwan, too, right, guys? Is anyone here from Taiwan? Oh, all right, good. This family is very sharp, very nice farm. They have a lot of typhoons there. They've had some typhoons recently, I think. So they just had one when I was here. This was back a few years ago, and I had the privilege to visit this farm. Very good operation. Family farm run there. Now, we're back in Arkansas, South Arkansas this summer. Uh, just a, a farm, pretty neat. I want to show, we've had quite a bit of rain. <laughs> we had a lot of rain this summer, so you see things are green and cool. Now, we look inside this house. Okay, this is a U.S. house, that same house inside. This summer, it's really hot. You see all the fans? We've got a lot of, we've got a lot of air speed because, you know, hey, it's getting hot and humid. We need to move some air. And these are a big bird. They're going to be about 675 to 8 pound bird. And, you know, nothing wrong with that. Just wanted to show some more Arkansas places. Hey, we had three speakers, me, counting me, and Dr. Weidman and Dr. Matlock. We had three speakers from Arkansas. That's pretty good representation from our little state of about two million people. This next picture, can anybody tell me where they think this might be? China. That's exactly right. Very good, guys. Okay, these birds are raised on wire. Um, they're thick. Is there anything wrong with raising birds on wire? I know Dr. Weidman showed the feet and the issues. You've got to really manage it. 
You can separate the, you're separating them. You don't have to have litter. You're separating the birds from their manure. It falls through. So you can have less, you know, cleaner birds, less disease. So this, this is a, not a bad thing at all. Now, it takes some extra special management to handle and work with this. I guess if you have a bird that for some reason dies, you have to get it out of there. And uh, I've got another picture of this in a different house. You see the feed, oops, you see the feed down the trough here. Um, and you see the people taking care of it. Again, people, and this is in China, make this work. You can do, you know, we have colony houses. You can grow birds in tiers and uh, pull the manure out. Is there anything wrong with that? Well, they're not as loose and free as <laughs> it kind of looks like a cage. But, we, but you can grow very good, high-performing birds in those facilities, right? I'm sure you have some here in Europe. I know they have them in different parts of the world. China has some. Um, there's not that many in the United States. The Jansen House or some of those houses. But basically what I was trying to show in these pictures was, hey, we can grow birds sustainably all around the world in different ways. We're using what we have. And so, it, and again, we're feeding the people. Okay, why is, feed, why is feed cost so important to sustainability? Well, feed cost is, you know, we measure it. You see that 0.5742 cents per, kilo, per kg live? Hey, man, we, me we measure that stuff down to the 10,000th more. It's not more than that because we're talking to billions of pounds of birds. It ties in a lot. So we really watch every little penny, right? We're always trying to be better. So feed cost, in this case, if you put the two things together, is almost 70% of our live cost. So now feed cost is coming down, maybe it'll drop to 55 or 60. It's still a lot. It's still a big chunk of growing a broiler. So it's very important. Whoa. Natalie, this is feed again from, from New Zealand. Beautiful pellets, probably all wheat with some grain sorghum. Very little corn because they, they don't really want a yellow bird at all. They want a whiter bird. Very nice quality. You don't see any fines. I mean, how would everybody like to have that? In the U.S., we don't, get, <laughs> we don't usually get that nearly that good. But I just want to show some really nice feed. So feed manufacturing, making good pellets is certainly... A, Nothing wrong with that. I really like it. Uh, this is a picture of our research farm in Russellville, Arkansas. You say, whoa, what are you talking about research? How does that have to do with sustainability? <clears throat> well, you can imagine people bring us stuff all the time to test. It's, you know, it's going to improve our performance, the feed conversion. Everything's got some, everybody's got some feed things. Uh, or we want to test breeds, or we want to test uh, feeding programs, right? Management, vaccines. If you've got your own facilities, it gives you an advantage. I believe in that. You know, we collaborate with the University of Arkansas in many places, institutes, uh, to do tests. But it's always good to do it in our own farm, in our own birds, in our own feed, in our own environment, right? So, well, we've really cut back on the stuff that we do. Because it costs a lot of money to do research. Most companies don't want to do that anymore, right? It's very unfortunate. Even I have to fight, because I can't, you can see this is an old barn. It's not got tunnel, really. It's just an open-sided house. And the rest of it, it's hot. So in the summer, I suffer there, but we do grow birds like that. Small pen, 100 bird pens, and I really believe in it. Uh, we use people from the University of Arkansas, or, or we process the birds at their, at their uh, processing plant. We also use people from Arkansas Tech to help us run the farm. So we, we, get, we train and learn people and try to collaborate so that we can build uh, better relationships. The final thing, a little bit, just a little bit about uh, economic priorities from country to country. Everybody has different priorities, right? What's your goals? Do you want the best growth rate, fee conversion? Do you want the most profitable through the processing plant? Um, if you're selling feed, you want pellets, but you want to, you know, you got to, you got to supply your customers. So, I'm taking this uh, this next set of research from St Dr. Steve Bolin at, at Cobb, and he listed these things, and then he set up some trials. Well, I'll, I'll skip past the. You can get on the Cobb webpage and you can see these nutritional recommendations. And you can see the same thing with Avigid. You can get online and see. This, it's broken out how you feed the birds and stuff like that. But Steve did a study, I think, at the UK somewhere, maybe in Scotland. I don't know the exact institute, so he set up a trial. I just wanted to share a little bit, a little bit with you of how it, how he set it up quickly, had two energy levels, 
and he had uh, four amino acid levels, what he called low, medium, high, and extra high. And there's the grower diet, starter, and finisher diet. So he, just three phases. And I do some of the same stuff myself, trying to figure out how to feed the birds better, right? But if, you know, I'm learning from him, we share, we back and forth. It's good information to look at. So this is how the birds performed. And that's adjusted FCR. These are all males. Uh, to that weight and with those different diet programs, different treatments. So, and this is the economic evaluation of how we, he tried to say, okay, what is your goal? If you're selling, if you're selling birds for, through the processing plant and not deboning, but just selling whole birds, the most, the most cost effective was the, the high. The birds, that's per bird, profit over feed cost, okay? So it's a way of looking at the economics. There's not a lot of difference sometimes in some of these things, but when you're talking about billions of pounds of live birds, it, makes a, it can make a big difference, you see. Very competitive business. I know I've run out of time, but modern birds, they definitely respond to protein and amino acids. Energy was in there too, so just something I wanted to share just to show you a little bit of nutritional stuff too. It has something to do with sustainability because it's, if, you're, if you're trying to make the most profit, what I try to do at Tyson, of course, is try to make the most profit through the plant. If I'm deboning 50% of my birds, I'm figuring that in too. So sometimes we get to chasing the live cost and we don't look at, into the plant. So when you want to keep in business, you know, it's always good to look at that because we're selling what we can sell through the plant, what goes to the customer. And that includes yield to breast meat, uh, uh, carcass fat, you know, whatever we're looking at, we're trying to man optimize that. Sometimes agrostats drives us to look just at live cost. Finally, the, just to summarize, the main thing again is what is, to me, you know, there's these three pillars here. You've got profit, economics, sustainability. If we, I, I still hang, hang on to that. That's to me, if I don't do that, then I can't help the environment. I can't help the people. We'd be out of business. Uh, somebody else would be doing it, right? But I'm not against. All these things are interrelated. If we're doing our efficiency, right, we're going to make more profit. We're going to be more efficient. We're going to take care of the people. We're going to be able to pay higher wages. We're going to produce more meat to feed more people around the world, right? And the poultry is so good at that. So, you know, I hope maybe you've thought of a question. And... <laughs> And that's my last slide. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sid. Very good. Thank you for keeping the attention of people uh, awake at this time of the afternoon.